My name is Shana Plout, Dr. Shana Plout, but Shana Plout, I'm the director of the Center for Social Science Research and Policy at the University of Manitoba. My name, if you translate it, means beautiful refugee. Uh, I went to a high school where there was 43 languages spoken in my high school, and I thought that was normal. Um, my classmates um, were either refugees or children of refugees from Soviet Union, Iran, El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, e everywhere. And I, and I had no idea that that was unusual. Uh, my own family, uh, they came, they, they were fleeing anti-Semitism. Um, uh, from what is now Poland and now Ukraine and also Germany. Um, so issues regarding refugees, um, they're not issues. They're my family, they're my classmates, they're my teachers. Um, but uh, at the same time, in, in, in my own academic work, uh, I work uh, looking at how people represent themselves in their own advocacy and in their own uh, way of trying to make change and one of the things about this event that I wanted to be able to do through the Center for Social Science Research and Policy is bring people together who have lived experience, who are lawyers, who are economists, uh, who are within government, bring people together in order to say okay over the past 10 years here in Manitoba we have had three very significant different waves of, of refugees and other people seeking safety. What has worked in the way that Manitoba has responded? What has not worked? And what are some lessons we can take forward? And it was important to me that when we talk about Manitoba, we're not just talking about government, but we're talking about the diaspora community. We're talking about private business. We're talking about the airport. We're talking about the provincial government. We're talking about the federal government. We're talking about media. So really recognizing Manitoba in all of what makes up Manitoba and seeing, okay, the way Manitoba has responded to Syrians and Yazidis, the way Manitoba has responded to Afghans and the way Manitoba has responded to Ukrainians are very, very different. How can we use this to go forward? The government is responsible to the people and the people also must hold the government responsible. When you're only relying on one, um, you are abdicating responsibility from the other. So governments respond to the pressure of people. And um, I, I, I think with that we do need volunteers and we do need civil society to help shape government policy. Um, and to hold the government to account. At the same time, the government needs to be able to provide the resources where this can be done in a good way. So I don't think it's an either or situation. It has to be a both and situation because you don't want government just creating policies either, right? You're not gonna be having some sort of uniform cookie cutter situation. When you do, that's when you have a situation where you can only bring your immediate nuclear family here to Canada, right? Because there's a particular Canadian understanding of what family is, which doesn't work for most of the rest of the world. But you also don't want to be relying only on volunteers because then it, it, it enables the government to escape its responsibility um, to be providing a safe place for people to live a life of dignity. I want to see people like Shaquilla running organizations. I want to see people who have lived experience shaping policy, not just implementing policy. I also want to see that there is people like Dr. Jesse Hager, who is an economist, be able to provide that lens when we're discussing what gov economic policy should look like in terms of, of, of refugees. Uh, I also wanna see people within, like Dr. Shada Labman, be able to hold that legal perspective. And I wanna see people like Nick Kravatz who shape communications in not just Winnipeg, but in all of Manitoba, be able to frame some of those narratives. That's what I want to see. Last summer,
Ukrainians were getting off the plane. They were walking around downtown Toronto in plus 30, knocking on people's doors, saying, can I get a bottle of water? Can I get a place to stay with air conditioning? They were exhausted. This has not happened here in Manitoba, and I'm very proud and fortunate for that response because they get temporary accommodations here. They get three meals a day for up to 30 days. So there's over officially uh, 12,000 Ukrainians have come to Manitoba. Uh, various places they've actually are residing. The majority of them are in Winnipeg, uh, but however, there are Ukrainians going to various communities: Winkler, Steinbeck, Brandon, Dauphin, for example. Uh, also, we are seeing currently about 50 people on average every day at the airport, and these numbers do fluctuate. With uh, let's say the summertime when the airfare was more expensive, or around the Christmas holidays where they went sort of down a bit. But uh, last fall, the numbers just spiked. Uh, very large numbers were coming. In the month of September, there was about 2,000 people alone came there. Um, so again, the numbers do fluctuate, but now they're starting to go up again after the Christmas holidays. We are advocating for supports that refugees do get it should be extended and uh, expanded to Ukrainian newcomers because they, when they do come here, they do not necessarily get the same supports, and they're certainly not getting permanent protection. So that's a very key difference. Uh, however, we are certainly advocating for that to happen, uh, to get those kinds of supports on a more permanent basis because this program, the visa program, is potentially going to expire at the end of March next month, March 31st. And we're certainly hoping that this program will be extended because the war is not showing any signs of stopping and the numbers and the demand for the program are continuing to grow. Um, so again, we certainly hope that typical supports that refugees get are extended and continue to be maintained for Ukrainian newcomers. I would say that people are coming here from a range of circumstances. There are people that have come with resources, but many have come with very limited or no resources. So the, the needs and demands are different. Uh, however, there are some commonalities in terms of finding longer-term housing after the temporary accommodations program sort of ends for them, uh, finding a job, finding daycare, finding schools for their children and so forth. And that's very difficult to do if your English level is at a minimum or you don't speak any English at all. So how do you find a good paying job that will help you pay for rent, for example? Or uh, you know, how do you enter the workforce if you have two or three kids that you have to look after and you can't have daycare? And we're, we're seeing those challenges on, on a lot of people. Uh, particularly mothers with children who are in these circumstances and because they're a one income sort of household for example and they're dealing with multiple things and but still trying to you know keep the roof over the head um, so the one-time financial assistance that they receive from the federal government is certainly appreciated however it is one time mm -hmm. and it runs out very quickly it's only three thousand dollars per adult so you factor in a monthly rent some grocery bills or a phone bill month month and a half goes by those funds are gone um, so it's very stressful for a lot of people uh, in terms of their anxiety of whether this program will be continued and hopefully it will be continued but uh, the supports when the, when the reality sets in like we discussed after you know the five six month mark what happens when the funds are depleting or if if you're working in sort of a lower paid job and you can't afford rent uh, I think those are some concerns and challenges facing a lot of people right now we do know that more than 12,000 have officially come to Manitoba, uh, and that's either directly or indirectly. So we, we are also aware of circumstances when people have first arrived in, let's say, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, they're there for a few weeks or a month, they realized that the, the cost of living, for example, is much higher in Toronto or compared to Winnipeg. So we've seen people that are there and they've actually come to Manitoba and then sort of transition and settle here more, you know, on a longer term basis than they were previously. So the numbers are sort of not totally accurate in that sense of how many are actually here at the moment and how many have left and so forth and how many are coming from other provinces. Um, so the best indicator right now is the issuance of Manitoba health numbers. And we know that number has officially across 12,000 people. Before people make a decision to apply under this program, they have to seriously do their research and not just come on a whim, you know, uproot their lives or thinking about it's going to be very easy here to settle because it's not. A typical immigrant that comes to this country takes about 18 to 24 months to settle. And that's with planning, with resources, with let's say a two-person income household, uh, with resources or more than a suitcase or a backpack. So 
the Ukrainians are very, or some of them at least, are put in a very difficult circumstance when they have to fled, flee with the clothes on their back in some cases, or taking their children and running from missiles. So it's a very different kind of context of how people are coming. I, I realize that, but again, if you're going to be staying in Ukraine or coming under this program, making the decision to come here, again, re you need to do your research. And we've seen people at the beginning when this program happened, all they knew about was Toronto or Vancouver. I want to go to Toronto or I want to go to Vancouver to see the mountains. Okay, well, how are you going to s survive? How are you going to sustain yourself there? And then that's, this is where we see the sort of the narrative shift where people were going elsewhere, thinking about other options other than Toronto, Vancouver, you know, maritime provinces, for example, uh, Manitoba. And Manitoba stepped up really early in this uh, process to welcome people with open arms and provide them that temporary accommodations program, which does not exist in any other province in Canada. So it's a very significant uh, resource and help for them to come here. Um, but again, I, I think people thinking it's an easy transition, it's not. And uh, they really need to seriously consider that. The program does have positives and, and some negatives and drawbacks. However, there is an economic impact for sure uh, of of Ukrainians coming to this country. Here in Manitoba, for example, there were many uh, labor shortages, for example, in all kinds of sectors, agriculture, uh, transportation, um, distribution, all kinds of sectors that Manitoba economies relied on. And Ukrainians uh, could fill those roles very seamlessly, I think, in terms of having the support network with the provincial government, with the community. They get sort of a win-win situation, and we talked about in the discussion earlier about this sort of investment lens, that how these resources, yes, initially there is a uh, requirement for resources, but once Ukrainians settle here, they're paying taxes, they're working, that will be recouped in in leaps and bounds, I think, over above the in investment which taking them to come here. But again, there are some significant challenges of what they're experiencing, and I think uh, in terms of what we discussed about sort of the daycare, the English, and all, all those kind of practical things of how do you survive longer than the, the first initial, um, you know, first few months when you're here, when you're on a kind of a high, you know, I, I'm, I'm in Canada now. Uh, however, when that three, four, or five month mark happens and you don't have a job yet, or you're, Engl you're waiting for an English language course to get a better job, it's going to be tough. And uh, that's why it's so important that the capacity and resources are increased so that they can transition more quickly and start getting that investment back. I'm listening to Nick talk about the immense support that the Ukrainian diaspora is able to contribute here also makes me really conscious of all the refugee groups who arrive. I don't think there's a singular group in Canada at all that has such a strength of diaspora support here. And so what the government needs to do better is equal the playing field. I'm Shauna Labman. I'm the executive director of Global College at the University of Winnipeg, and I'm a legal academic who studies refugee resettlement and refugee law. I think we've learned how to do better supports, both from a government side and a settlement side, uh, more volunteers, more Canadians come into supporting. Uh, but the work to recreate your life in a new place is always going to be hard. One of the things that's great about Canada is that we have long-term history of private sponsorship. So since the 1970s, Canadians have been sponsoring refugees from all over the world to Canada, and that means Canadians know refugees, know of the stories of their flight, and know of their settlement struggles when they arrive. And that makes Canadians, for the most part, pretty strong advocates for refugees, and governments are responsive to that. They they hear that Canadians care and that's really important. I'm a Winnipegger from birth. I grew up here. I was away for a long time. I worked for the United Nations in India and one of the reasons I returned to Manitoba for my work is because Manitoba in particular has always been a particular place of strength and support uh, for refugee welcome and that's partially due to, for a long period of time, we've seen refugees as part of our population building strategy. And it's a place where 
our downtown is small and people share space and know each other and that's really wonderful. Some of the refugee comes from very, um, you know, um, they experience very uh, traumatic life. So um, here at the beginning it might be all rosy and beautiful, but like five months down the road, mm -hmm. the reality hit, yes? So there, then there will be lots of challenges. For me that all of my work experience has been with the newcomer, especially refugee um, communities. I think this event um, will help that uh, public or people in the sector find about the you know like resources that exist. Um, if you know like aca um, people from academy uh, academia sh uh, participate in this event, so they they hear the front line you know like. Um, a struggle or services that is available. So if if they see the point to you know like conduct a research or write a paper or whatever, so that um, um, it create a pathway to you know like um, educate other people that are not in the sectors um, about the program and services that exist um, exist for the refugees and. Um, I'm hoping that it can have a positive impact on policymaker, on people, uh, on people from the you know like government level that they see the struggles or the success and the challenges, and maybe they can, um, you know, like <coughs> review the policies. Some of the policies are very outdated, so they can review and you know like um, create an updated version of policy for certain programs um, that uh, exist in the in in. Or Manitoba. I've been refugee. I was born when there was war in my country, so I I spent all of my childhood, teenager life uh, being refugees, and um, and I know how difficult it is to be a refugee. To you know, like not um, grow your your root in in one country is like um, and the discrimination that you face um, and lack of uh, opportunities just because you're a refugee. Um, so the hardship that I went through um, during my, you know, like teenager time or you know, like early youth, I don't want the other people that come to to feel that hardship. I I help them, or I'm in this sector to make it easier for those people for the for the new generation. So at least. Obviously, I cannot, you know, like solve all the <laughs> all the problem and make it all rosy and stuff like that. But at least, um, you know, like make it easier for them to in, um, to uh, grow or or integrate in the new society. When I came to Canada, there was only two organization: Immigrant Center and um, uh, Immigration Interfaith Manitoba, which uh, for sure they call it Welcome Place. Um, so they were uh, welcome place were provided uh, were providing uh, services for the government refugee and immigrant center for people that come as immigrant. The only thing that were exist there was some English conversation classes and cooking classes as immigrant center and and then English classes for adult. So there was no um, after the school program for the youth at the, at the schools or you know like. Uh, or other program that currently exists right now for for the refugees. If I compare the services, the current services with the time that I came to Canada uh, or to Winnipeg, I should say, yes, there are way way more services. Um, can these services make it easier for the you know like for the refugees, especially youth, to you know like to make their integration easier? Yes and no. Um, if people got in the, uh, get into right places, right program, um, yes, it has a you know like um, great positive impact on their life and the path that they choose. But these services usually concentrated in some area of the city, but not uh, all over the cities. Yes, like um, maybe for example, school division one or downtown has lot. Uh, there is a saturate, uh, saturated. Um, amount of services exist for the newcomer and refugee, but if you leave, um, for example, in Transcona, the services are limited. You, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. there is, it exists, but it does, it's not as much. 
and then for the refugee family that live in a, you know, like in, in further area for the youth to participate in this program. Um, sometimes it's challenging, yes, because they have to come to the program to, to get the bus ticket to be able to com communicate, uh, co uh, commute between home and, and, um, and, uh, and the program place. Sometimes it's not possible, especially, you know, like in, in, in Winnipeg, um, most of the year is winter and the weather get dark <laughs> very <laughs> like at four o'clock so some families are worried um about their safety because they don't speak the language and stuff like that so there is uh, there is more services in comparison to the time that i came but this still is not distributed equally in all, all over the city some area has a saturated part of the program or services and some area is only one or two program exists mm -hmm. everything that you see in a society it's a policy it's a political act so um, most of the you know like um, MPs or MLA uh, they promise the programs and stuff like that but they cannot carry or they they don't try very hard to carry those programs so they have um, according to the policy or whatever they have, so they increase the number of refugee, but they, you know, like the number of services or pro proper services did not increase. So um, I think one of the reasons could be lack of advocacy um, and informing the MPs or, or politician. Um, because, you know, like if politician wants vote, yes, like in October of 2023 there is a voting season so now if you go to p if if immigrant and refugee advocate for any program right now because they want the vote their vote so they probably you know like um, agree to um, to run that program um, and also it has to be a united voice across you know like if I do it individually it won't be as impactful as you know like 50 of us <laughs> uh, um, talk about the same concern. Um, so um, it's uh, again boiled down to the you know like policy, policy maker, uh, political uh, figure. Um, that's why they pro you know they don't do proper job. The federal government always says that we don't have enough resources. Uh, that's why the application for refugee take very long time. Some some of the refugee. Their application took ten years, you know, seven years, five years, three years. They until they they got the visa to come here. Minimum is like two years, and if somebody comes within two years, they're just like, oh, you know, like um, the process was was short for us. Same thing with the private sponsorship. So uh, um, I'm hoping that the same process that they are using for Ukrainian. Um, you know, uh, people to come here, they can use it across the board for everyone. Um, so the process will be in a, you know, like take shorter amount of time so everybody, um, instead of, you know, like waiting in the refugee camp, they can, they can come here sooner.